Welcome to the show, everyone. We have, this is the most unique show I think I've ever done because of our subject and because of our guests. But before we get there, if you're listening on the podcast, come on over to the video, jjfilzames.tv. If you're here on YouTube and you found me because of David or his book, hi, I'm JJ. And in case you don't know, this is my show. What that means is I'm going to talk. So if you don't like me, which I'm totally cool with, David, where can they find more of just you? <laughs> uh, go, go to discoverfromscratch.com or in all likelihood, they'll be will be on uh, television very soon. We're negotiating with a, a streamer, so you can find the show from scratch uh, there, wherever that is. And you could also follow him on Instagram. You're on Instagram, so IG, can, that's right. Yep. Did, and you, did my agents tell you to 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 say that because they tell me to say that all the time, and I don't remember. But yes, I do have an Instagram account, and it shows a lot of cool things on it. You can see my work, you can see my family, you can see books I like. Yeah, and you'll announce where the show is going to be because Lord knows it was a pain in the ass to try to find it the other that's day. Right, that's right. Well, so, one of the things, I mean, this is what I explained to you is that we had to scrub everything uh, once we went into the only place you can see it. It's actually like crazy. You could see it around the world, but not in America. We're in, I think, 17 countries right now, but you cannot see it here unless you watch little clips. If you watch you little do? clips real quick on my Instagram, you can kind of get a semblance <laughs> Piece of Piece together show. a show. You're yeah, hilarious. there you go. So for those of you that have, if you're here you're on YouTube and you haven't heard the bio, uh, so David Moscow has written a book called From Scratch. And today, October 25th, 2022, it is launching today. You can get the book today. Today is when it releases. Please buy the book. Uh, you'll buy it by the end. I trust me. But we're going to talk about the show because this came from a show. It was a television. It is a television show first. But yeah. I need to back up because what you guys don't know is that 15 years ago, yeah. I was David's personal trainer. <laughs> now, when I did the math on that, I thought to myself, you and I aren't old. But man, a number like that makes me think, should I feel old? <laughs> I don't. But I'm like, wow, 15 years ago. Well, we were babies when this started. <laughs> so that's that's how we got here. But yeah, you uh, it was amazing. You got me back in the gym <laughs> and uh, I hadn't rock been climbing. in a while and rock climbing and rock climbing as well. Um, and I, and you know, I, I actually, you know, took that, um, that fitness that you reinstilled in me and I, I have been working out ever since kind of, I mean, it ebbs and flows, you know, when you're on production, um, you know, for everybody who doesn't know, you know, who's coming from JJ's world, um, my show is, I go around the world. I work with chefs. Uh, they make me a meal. And then I hunt, gather, grow, forage every ingredient and come back and try and, and make the meal. So I'll end up like in the Andes in the middle of nowhere with no gym or no nothing. I'll have a jump rope and, and some running shoes. And that'll kind of be the most I can do. And those days are hard. I, I don't really get out <laughs> as much as I should. But And you'll see it in in the production. When I start a season, I'm in very good health. And then by, <laughs> by the end of the season, 10, I'm like, you've had too much pizza. Marlon um, Brando in, <laughs> in Apocalypse Now. Just shoot my face, guys. Well, I saw you doing jumping jacks in the background while you were waiting for your the boy. That was episode up. one. That was episode one. Yeah. Yeah. I that was, was like, season. okay, good for you. Look at him doing jumping jacks. He's trying to, you know, but part of your journey. So let's go. Let's just go backwards. So again, if you're, if you are, not on the podcast and you're watching this from YouTube, uh, you have probably seen David before and thinking to yourself, where have I seen him before? He looks kind of familiar. You know what? And as you get older, you look more like your younger self. I thought about that. I'm like, your hair, like you just like look like your 14 year olds. Was your 14 then when you did that? When you 12, did the movie? 12, 12. Okay. Yeah. So, so David's, was it your first role or just the biggest role? It was or my second audition, roles? but I actually, from the, from the first audition to it took a while for, for them to hire me because it, it went through some, well, tell them what it is and then we can get into me. What actually so happened. David, David is, uh, is the kid in big day. He's yeah. Tom Hanks, younger self. He's what yeah. Tom Hanks becomes when he fast forwards into becoming an adult. Um, so if you, you know, and big is on so many times reruns, I've texted you over the years, like, Hey, I'm watching big, uh, which yeah. I'm sure I'm not the only person who does that to you, but it's, it's just funny that, I, you know, like all the time, it's always on forever. I get, I get, whole life. I get photo texts when it's on 
And also when somebody runs into the Zoltar machine at some random, like the Santa Monica Pier, right? Yes, yes, that too. I think I, I, I did think of you. I think of you often because of that. I, I think wherever I was, maybe in Myrtle Beach, I was in Myrtle Beach and I saw one or something. Anyway, yeah, so David uh, was in Big and, and other productions since then. So I'm sure you've yeah. seen his face, but what he's been focusing on for the last, and you have a production company now, and I see yeah. you produced a bunch of uh, TV shows and movies. And but mostly this films. Is, oh, yeah. mostly films. Okay. Yeah. But this is your, this is like your baby because it's you yeah. and it's, and the, so let's talk about what even got you excited about like, who did, did you pitch this as a documentary and then it got turned into a TV show? Yeah. So, uh, you know, I, I produced a bunch of, when I stepped out from in front of the camera, I started really producing mostly independent, um, sort of like young auteurs and, uh, people who were like, you know, had this zest for creativity that, you know, when you've been an actor for 25 years, it starts to wear on you a little bit. And I got a little bored, but I would meet these youngsters who really were like excited about creating. And I was like, I can get behind them. And so my company, we ended up producing about 27 films and, um, and, uh, and in the Heights, the Broadway show was actually one of the first things I produced. And so we kind of like, we're in that world. And um, one of my investors and I had had this idea. We were both really sort of disgusted with the, you know, when Trump was running for election and he was really villainizing um, Central Americans, Mexicans particularly. And it just felt like, you know, especially in California, Mexico uh, is California. Like uh, uh, culture here is um, so tied and, and uh, Central Americans are, our families, our friends, our neighbors, and also they make most of our food. <laughs> and, you know, I just thought about like the taco is, you know, 4 billion served and the margarita is the number one cocktail in America. It just seems silly to be sort of slandering these people. So I wanted to create a documentary about how do you, how a taco is made, how, how a margarita is made. And I would go down to Oaxaca and work with subsistence farmers and they would show me how you make masa and then I would I would go to Jalisco and and work with Himadors and make tequila, and we would just do this doc. And my agent, Rep Bourdain, um, and so so I made a sizzle about this, and um, and I was working with Clay Jeter, who's the main director of Chef's Table, so incredible talent. And he's a producer on my project, and so we made this sizzle about me um, being doing a wild boar hunt. Um, and, and I had never, I'm not a food producer. I don't hunt. I don't really make anything. I'm coming from being a city guy um, and really exploring the hard work um, that happens. And so when we made this sizzle, we showed it to my agent and they were like, we would like to show this to Anthony. Is that cool? And I said, yeah. <laughs> and then they came back and said, you don't, it'd be much better if this wasn't a doc, you could make this uh, a series. And and each week you look at a different food culture and um, what makes it different from the shows that are on air is mostly the shows are following chefs and really focused on what happens in the kitchen. And this is about the six months prior to, you know, the food coming into the, into the restaurant. And so, um, yeah. So, you know, we went through the ups and downs of trying to get it off the ground. It was, we were at travel channel and then we were at, Apple Plus, and then we were nowhere, and then and then we ended up at A and E Networks for the last two seasons, and it looks like um, we're gonna have a new home, uh, which I'm excited about. Um, bigger this, audience, so from the time of right now when we're recording this and the time it airs, do you think the deal will be done? That the deal will be made. For where it's going to end up so for those of you so i so i got david's book and i was reading david's book and but it, again the book came after the show and he got to do something different with the book and elaborate a little bit more than you do you know you have to talk in sound bites and you have to create some drama and you have to have you know your different scenes that you have when you're creating a show yeah. and not everybody wants to know all the thoughts you're thinking and uh it's it's a reason why i i'm not a huge fan of eat pray love uh, because i feel like sh she's too in her head and her head makes me crazy um but i love the movie I love the movie because you're not in the head. You're like seeing what's what they're doing on the outside of that. I mean, there's some thoughts and the frustration with meditation and whatever, but I really enjoy the movie much more because of that. And this is the opposite. Now we get to know when you're out there, like this, the book 
fills in the personal experience and fills in the education piece that you just don't have time for yeah. when you're filling when you're filming you know when you were in Italy in Naples I have to laugh because I literally just bought, I was going to bring it and I didn't I have a bag and I was going to say hey, look what I have I have a Caputo zero zero gluten free flour from <laughs> Italy and I have to tell you when I ordered I was like what the hell does zero zero mean and then you explained it I'm like oh no I know yeah I don't know I mean I wouldn't have literally searched to find out but now I understood what it meant so thank you for that so uh yeah so when we go back to the show I was like well I want to see and I'd seen clips on YouTube and different places but I'm like I'd like to watch an episode and here I am looking and texting you're like where is it I'm on everything I'm on Apple TV I'm on Prime I'm on anyway so so the minute so please follow David on Instagram yeah. And check in with the show. If in fact the deal is made, that it'll be in the show notes where the show is going to end up so you can watch it. Yeah. Doug was watching it with me and he he thought it was really entertaining. And he's a he's a, a fly fisherman. So when we were watching you oh, fish, very cool. And uh, you know, <laughs> he, he was like he sees I mean, me he, bumbling, stumbling. <laughs> well, he's not a, he, he does it past time, part time. You know, he doesn't doesn't do that often. He right. loves it. It's not, he throws them back. He doesn't catch them to eat them. Um, but it was interesting to see his perspective when you were fishing. And then um, and then just like looking at all the farms and and all of the livestock and milking the goat and, you know, and then it, just learning how hard it is. And those little potatoes that were like- yeah, the four corner. Peanut size and yeah. that you would never even know. I never knew about them. I never oh. knew about them until, until that episode. I mean, something that is, uh, uh, it's possibly the oldest domesticated plant in America, um, likely the oldest domesticated potato uh, uh, in in the world, um, and was a huge food source for Native Americans here, and then completely disappeared because of sort of the genocide against the Native Americans, um, and now is being revitalized and brought back by the Diné uh, people, which is super phenomenal, and just like you know, right next door, right next door in in uh, the four corners area right so uh and then you get down there and what an incredible tasty flavor as well like nutty you know takes that large fluffy you know idaho potato shrink wraps it into this teeny nugget of of flavor and boom um amazing and and in a, in a world where we all feel like oh we've done everything right we know everything that's out there to for this to magically come around and you're just like, holy smokes, I've never had anything like this, you know? Um, so those discoveries on the show, I'm discovering them and, and getting to appreciate them as much as anybody, um, which, you know, I think is, uh, again, you know, part of the, the reason why our show is a little different is because I'm not an expert and I'm sort of the audience's eyes and, uh, and, and hopefully asking the questions that they would want to ask and experiencing these new things. So, well, it, it, yeah, no, I, well, and so I'm thinking, well, when you're asking that and not that I was thinking this when I was watching the show, but just sort of like when you explained uh, the zero, zero flower, uh, you know, I like right now, I just thought of, well, I wonder what the nutritional composition of that potato is. I wonder how it's different in terms of glycemic index or insulin resistant or, you know, insulin. Well, you have to read, you have to read chapter four of my book. <laughs> right. Okay. Well, I, so I went, I went New York oysters. Okay. I went, right. I watched the Utah show. I went, yeah. and, um, I read the beginning obviously. And I read Italy because I had to get to the pizza chapter. Right. And when you're going to make pizza, uh, cause that is one place in Naples I have not been to in Italy. And I was, cause we're redoing. So I, you know, I moved a year ago. I bought a house. No, hi. Yeah, yeah. And, um, and so we have like half an acre and we're going to be doing this amazing landscaping project in the next, I guess at this point in the next year, and I'm going to have a pizza oven. And so I was looking up oh, and, wow. there's a, and there's a vegan Italian restaurant near you. And there's one near where I have my events and we go every year that she does. And she's in Italy right now as we speak, but she has the best gluten-free pizza. I mean, you would never know. No one would ever know that it was gluten-free because oh, it wow. acts just like gluten. It's fluffy. It's thin. It's just like Italian pizza. And, and I was going to ask her and kind of press into her about her recipe when I get my pizza oven. But then I started to do a little research and I saw that everybody was using the Caputo zero, zero flour. And I was like, well, I'm going to get that. And now I'm like, what the hell does that mean? Why is it zero, zero? Why is there even anything on it? Anyway, which we can talk about, but I digress because these are the specifics that you start to learn about and that you expand upon in the book, Yeah. Um, which let's talk about the benefits for people watching, because we want them to do both. We want them to yeah, yeah, yeah. watch the show and we want them to buy the book. So well, the book watching... can become a Bible 
you know, a knowledge Bible in many ways. And there's also recipes in the back and um, you, you start to, uh, th the show is really an adventure. You want to sit back, you want to watch, you want to see great food. You want to see someone trying to make meals and meeting interesting people around the world. That's what the show is about. The book is really a deep dive into history of ingredients of places and of food production around the world. And then also looking at sort of what we realized as we went along. So I wrote this book with my dad. My dad is a writer on the show. So as I'm out in the field, I'd come back and be like, um, you know, we didn't catch any fish in the Philippines. Uh, uh, and I'm making patisse, which is this um, fish sauce, which is almost like a, it's a foundational ingredient in Philippine cuisine. It's almost like ketchup, right? And um, it's on everybody's table when you're eating a Filipino meal and you have to catch fish. And we went out all night and didn't catch anything. And, and we're in the South China Sea. Uh, and so we start doing research. I asked the fishermen, does this happen a lot? And they're like, yeah, every year we have to go out further or longer. We don't catch anything. And um, so we started doing a deep dive and we realized that the South China Sea, the Philippine Sea, the East, whatever anybody calls it, because there's all these territorial disputes in that area of the world that it has, it's, it's lost about 50 to 70% of its fish in the last 20 years. One third of the fishing boats in the world are there. And all these territorial disputes are supposedly for land, but it's really for fish. China saying this is ours. The Philippines saying this is ours. Taiwan saying this is ours. Vietnam. I mean, you've got these, whatever, 12 countries hammering this area. And they are all fighting. And so no one can reach across the sea and say, hey, we need to figure something out or there's going to be nothing here for any of us to have anyway, even if you the demarcation line moves. So it's something that was you realize that food production, food producers are on the front line of climate change, overconsumption, um, economic issues. So you really get a, a, a snapshot or a, more than that, you get a, a lesson, a, a crash course in the state of the world and some of the scary stuff that, you know, humankind is headed towards. I mean, there's also hope, right? Like you go to Finland, even in the Philippines, you go to Finland, you go to Iceland, you go to Costa Rica, they're doing really wonderful things, right? Costa Rica, something you learn from them, don't have a military, right? Because then you can take a lot of money and put it into sort of making people's lives better. Um, Iceland, start putting uh, uh, limits on catch, right? Every person in Iceland has a, a permitted amount of fish that they can get, and that's corporations and individuals. Um, the Philippines, and this is more complicated, you know, they want to sell fish to the EU, but people in the EU would like sustainable fish. So the Philippines had to figure out, okay, we're going to create these marine protected areas, and that's going to allow for fish to rebuild, fish stocks to rebuild, which also helps local fishermen so they don't have to go out as far. Um, and they're wrestling with that because they'd like to export fish. So in that way, you know, the collection, the union of concerned, you know, citizens in the EU are forcing economically the Philippines to adjust, which is good. And, you know, people in America are doing the same thing. And, and I think people around the world are starting to shift. Um, I hope more, you know, from the book, we, it really is about sort of like what we can do um, individually um, and the pressure we can put on our governments, on our corporations. Um, so that's another thing that, that comes out of it. It really gives you a, uh, the agency, um, to what to do next and, and sometimes how to eat. Uh, uh, where to buy from. Um, yeah. I think that, that was a little well, ranty. Oh my no, goodness. That's okay. That's okay. <laughs> um, trust me. I expected it. It's okay. Um, and, and it's not unwarranted. It's the difference of, you know, I think I told you I'm, I'm working with people, you know, on the emotional side more than anything right now. And, and it, it, it happens, you know, in order for there to be change, there has to be a problem. 
people are generally not going to change their lifestyles on any level, whether it be how they do something, how they eat, their behaviors will not change until they're forced. And so sometimes the contrast needed is, you know, a big freaking mess. A big freaking mess for us to say, oh my God, we, or the consequence of the behavior has to be uncomfortable enough to force somebody to change. And that's unfortunately human nature for most of us. It's not necessarily me. I mean, I'm sure it's me in some ways, but generally I'm the one that sees. No, there are some people who go out there and want to grow constantly and get better. Right. But the majority of us, you know, don't. Right. Right. I mean, I, you know, I remember, in fact, it ties back to, do you remember when, uh, when you went off to it was Washington. You were gone on a trip with Carrie and you were uh, you hired a trainer there and you were boxing with weights. And I was about to fire you because I was like, dude, you were not listening to me. You were going to wreck your joints. I go, you don't must not trust me. It's totally cool. You can go, no, 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 okay, I won't do it anymore. I won't do it anymore. Um, but it's like, because here I, you know, I was thinking about your joints, not about your fitness level or what you looked like, because yeah. I can see that yeah. doing stupid things like that are going to you know hurt you and then you're not gonna be able to work out anyway. And so I'm the one looking and I got that Aquarius Mercury. I'm looking down the line there and see it coming and I'll make the changes because all I need to do is have somebody tell me, don't do that. This is what I did. Look where I am. And I'm like, okay, I won't do that. So I, I, I mean, I know I'm weird that way. I don't, most people aren't like that, but in other ways I have to learn the lesson the hard way because yeah. I have to keep bumping up against it. So yeah, I like to come at it from here's the reality. And, you know, I sent you the Bruce Lipton show, the spontaneous evolution. And yeah, we're in trouble if we do nothing about it. But we have the ability to make change and to make great change and to make fast change. And it's one of the reasons why I wanted to move up here. I mean, I've always wanted to move up here. This was always my goal, you know, since I landed in LA, but to eventually at least have a place whether I was here full time or not, it's a different story. But I mean, you know, we have plans. I mean, we have right now we have like our tower garden and we've got fruit trees. And uh, so, you know, and I don't know that I'll ever have chickens, but you know, but here, like this is a place where it's almost like a burning man, like a big burning man in that, yeah. like if the world was to shut down, we'd be trading, you know, meats and, and vegetables and, you know, our farmer's market. So it, it comes back to the land. And we've been talking about sustainability on the show for a while and things like that. So people, you know, want to come back your relationship with your food, you know, yeah. food issues that people have. And you, one of the questions that you guys had put together, your publicist was about, and I was curious about your answer to this. Uh, what are some of the limitations of fast food culture? I'm just curious where that would take you. Like what, when you, when you have that wow. question as a possibility. Well I mean, one of the reasons we I did the show um, was because I had become so removed from where my food came from, even what I was eating. It was all this unconscious eating that was happening. Stuff comes wrapped in a paper, and I drive up to the window and shove it in my mouth, and like I'm not thinking about what I'm ingesting. Or when I go to the grocery store, getting things in boxes, you don't really know what's in them, and you're just they taste good, or they've got the salt and the sugar, and you know makes you want to eat it and um and then also like when i was younger I, I just had a boy i actually just had another baby but at the time when i started i had a, i just had a boy and i was thinking about like what were the things i enjoyed as a kid and what would i want him to do and it always came back to like apple picking or fishing with my grandpa or running through streams and looking for crayfish and like it, it really was this outdoor side of things that in new york and la it's you know hard so i would i was gonna have to really you know, make it important to go do this with him. And, um, and so what happens when, when you become removed from the food that you're eating, and, and this was initial, this was my initial thoughts, and then it grew as we went along. But initially, I thought I, I overconsume and I do mindless consumption, because I'm not thinking about what's happening here. Um, and then and then we, I quickly realized that, oh, this also harms the animals. It's why that there's all this uh, factory farming. It's why we treat the animals the way we do, because they're now, you know, this thing wrapped in plastic. We don't even see them as animals anymore, right? And then as we went further along during the show, we realized that, oh, we also treat the people who make our food terribly because we're removed from that. We We don't see the process, right? These are people far away from us and... We get whatever we want whenever we want it. We just got to throw money at it, except it never trickles down to those people, right? Um, the people, I always say that there's like, you know, the world kind of agrees that certain people should make more money, like nurses and teachers. And and for some reason, migrant workers are always left out of this. The people who work in restaurants are always left out of this, like economically. And so 
Um, and then and then the environment is injured, right? The the world that we live on. So this us being removed from our food, this fast food culture, getting anything you want anytime, um, has has hurts us health wise, hurts people economically, hurts the planet, or hurts the animals. And that's scary. So you can, if you start pulling this thread here and you start looking at food production as, as the litmus test, as the canary in the coal mine of how humanity is doing, it's, it's some scary stuff, whether it's, you know, uh, the Philippine Sea, the South China Sea emptying the fish, the Mediterranean is happening in the same way. Um, there's there, it's been like 28 countries hammering it for 10,000 years, right? And it's not a very fertile sea anyway. There's no major river flowing into it. Um, and then, you know, we meet with, with farmers who are trying to harvest year in and year out. And one year it's floods. The next year it's droughts. Like the, the, the environment is going crazy. But you can also look at food production as our guiding light. If we are able to figure out if our eating habits can change, right? So general less consumption of meat, meat moving to a condiment or or not every night, right? Like just eat like how my mom ate when she was a kid, right? They they didn't have beef in the center of every meal. They had chicken maybe once or twice a week. Meat was a beef was a very, very rare special occasion. Um so so that's one of the things. Um, and then that reverberates down, right? Especially if we're eating, if we're going to eat animal protein. We should buy from places that humanely raise animals and treat their workers humanely. And that means you pay more, right? So that hurts your pocket. It means you eat less meat, which is probably good for you and the planet. Um, and then, and then you start to really look at buying, um, as a consumer, really buying from places that are sustainable. Um, and those repercussions, you know, work the, the EU, the, the citizens of the EU deciding that they want sustainable fish, which then forces the Philippines and countries like the Philippines to sell them sustainable, they need to make marine protected areas, which then helps the Philippines and helps the planet. So if if you if we choose to, you know, eat sustainably, that's extremely helpful for our future, for humanity's future. And if we don't, then we're in deep trouble. Yeah. Well, you know, it's thinking back to so I've been gluten free this whole time. So since I've known you. Um and uh back then there wasn't, there weren't too many products or options in the market. I remember Trader Joe's had a brown rice bread that was like a brick and, uh, you know, was, <laughs> you, you, you just didn't want to eat it. It was, I mean, I think I tried a peanut butter and jelly, like one, it's just so heavy. It was unnecessary, but of course it's evolved. And in, in thinking about, am I using Thank goodness. Oh, I know what well, I, I mean, the last those... 15 years says there's some food on the market. That's delicious now, right? Not only gluten-free, but like cauliflower bread turned into like something you could eat right? right as opposed to like pressing it yourself in your house like anyway right. well well but i was thinking about you know when because I, I use this as a law of attraction example because a lot of times people want to shout at people what not to do or what to do and it's but it, it's a silent like where you spend your money nobody said to people stop making gluten they just said no i'll pay more for something gluten free yeah. and now we have an entire industry of products for people who are willing to put money and so i want to mention your comment about like yeah it hurts your pocketbook and i want people to again learn how to get into a frequency that manifests them more money and honestly guys like this is things aren't going to go back to the way anything was we continue to evolve and move forward which means you have to figure shit out so don't be a victim to your circumstance of I only make this much or I only have this job or like the the it's the it's grow or die. It's really you get the choice. If you're going to stand still and think that you're going to wait for the world for the gas prices to come down or for you know housing prices to come down, you're going to be so far behind it's going to be really frustrating and sad. It's going to feel unfair. But the reality of it is every generation, every new year, every 10, every decade, things progress and you go you're going to decide to get on that train or you're not. And so when it comes to looking at spending money on food, you can pay now or you're going to pay later. 
So if you're going to pay, if you pay now, you have the benefit of knowing that you're contributing to other people's lives and businesses and pocketbooks and uh, in a good way, like you're contributing. Um, if you're being cheap about your food, not only will your health suffer, right, but so will our economy and so will the world. So again, you have to kind of think a little long term. Don't be so short sighted about, you know, a dollar here or 50 cents here. I know some people get real crazy about that and find another way to make money. You know, we want to be in an abundance thinking and, and a possibility and problem solving, like looking for how do we be solutions based versus problem based. Yeah. So to be solution based, what can you do to make small changes in, you know, in what you're eating and how that affects other people? We buy a lot of our produce from the farmer's market here and we and we have and there are two farmers markets here and we want to grow our food i mean literally i'm going to be eating salads for the next six months because i got an entire tower garden full of lettuce uh that's literally going to all sprout at the same time um so and it's organic and all our trees are organic and we have fruit and we have our juices from here not that we drink that much juice but i mean literally i got a two orange trees a lemon tree a persimmon tree a grapefruit tree a, a pixie tree here in ojai and an apricot tree so, and we just planted an olive You're tree, so an avocado tree, California. and a fig tree. Oh, absolutely. Oh my gosh. It's amazing. But the weather, yeah, right? I mean, the weather. that's why we're here. But that's why we pay the money to be, <laughs> but that's why we pay the money to be here too, yeah, right? Very I mean, true. That's it's very not true. a, you, you have choice. And I think the most important, one of the most important messages, well, there's two in here. You know, what I love about the show and I love about the book, but what I love about the show is that you, like you said, and you did say that you're going to cook the meal, not on that first episode. You didn't cook it. The, the chef cooked it. So well, as he, you continue what you see a lot, this is a thing. What you see a lot with these chefs is, and it's the reason why they're amazing. And they have these restaurant empires is that they're, they, they like to control, <laughs> they like to control whenever they watch me destroying a dish, they're like, yeah, move over a little bit. So as the season went along, I took a little more sort of, I got empowered and I got in there a little bit more, but you know, when I'm messing up a filet and the chef is staring at me, like, what are you doing to this fish? Um, it's hard for me as well, but generally I do, I do cook the meals and I have my hands in it. And I, and sometimes I'm more of a sous chef. Um, but I want to speak to what you just said, because I think that there's another thing besides just the pocketbook. I think that it is now, super important for us to put pressure on our representatives and the corporations who are sort of running roughshod over the world at the moment. Um, it is really time to stand up and whether it is for food, um, whether it is for sort of um, economic justice, social justice, um, you know, when you are out there, when you're in the Philippines and you're seeing what hyper-capitalism, a very feudalistic society looks like teetering on the brink and you realize that we all could be there. Um, it's some scary stuff. And we are, um, if we don't stand up, then this could happen to us. I mean, what's going on in the Philippines, so... So the, the fish are the oceans being emptied there and the local fishermen and the oceans being emptied by major corporate uh, fishing. So that's like the U S Japan, the Philippines, China, um, Canada, and the local fishermen. Um, th there's a rule that they got, they have like the first mile or, or something like that. First 15 miles offshore, local fishermen can do it, but the middle sized, fishing boats that can't compete with the big massive trawlers are coming in and taking or moving into that 15 mile. So the local fishing communities are dying because they don't have any fish either. So then they are moving to Manila, basically the big cities, destabilizing the big cities, so a group of poor people moving into a city, uh, destabilizes any infrastructure that's there. Um, Crime rises, uh, uh, drugs, alcohol. Um, basically, people then turn to authoritarianism. You know, so you get despots in there. Right now, um, you know, you had Duterte there before, and then there was just an election um, where the son of their old dictator just came back into power. So you see how food production has immediate um 
uh, uh, issues around there has immediate um, oh my gosh impact my impact impact thank you on a country it, like literally we're watching sort of the collapse of of an amazing place um, because of poverty around food. Um, so but I think that's what, but I think that's what I'm, what I'm talking about. It wasn't just a dollar that you spend on yourself. It's what you're taking. It's what you're not spending the dollar on. It's when we, when people stop spending the money on the bigger things, on the bigger brands, on the bigger corporations, and you invest in the little guy, yeah. they're going to feel it. That's the fastest way besides that. yelling at people is not going to work. You take their money away. You, you invest your money in the little yeah. person and everybody wins because they will notice that if everybody stopped going to the grocery store, like a regular grocery store and buying mass produced food today for one day, yeah. for one day, the, the profit loss would be so big that they'd, they'd, have, have, to, to they'd have to listen. They'd have, they'd to, have to listen. listen. And, yeah. the, and that is a very empowering thing versus feeling like I'm just going to yell because I'm all not, you know, there's a balance of, of being the, uh, being the answer. And, uh, and then noticing the problem, right? Because too many people want to notice the problem and talk about nothing but the problem. And then we don't ever get an answer because we have everybody talking about the problem. So yeah. how do you be a part of the solution? Well, you you do the thing that's going to make the biggest impact. And it's always the bottom line. It's always not participating and and deciding that where you spend your money. Well, is I also like, you just talked about a general strike. <laughs> it's not only about the money and where you spend, but I mean, we were, we were in Iceland and... Um, and at the time, uh, th there was this legendary strike that they had there. Women were earning something like half the amount that men were earning and whatever. So all the women in Iceland, all the women in Iceland went on strike. And within a week, laws were passed. Basically, uh, uh, they elected a female uh, prime minister. Like, stuff changed. And since then, this happened like, I don't know, 15, 20 years ago. Um, men and women earned the same amount. Uh, they, the same amount of people are in parliament, like um, change the country. So we do have the power to shut down the economy if it continues to drift in a way that is not. And, and you're seeing in the United States, we are, um, as people, COVID exacerbated it. You know, when we were out there, we shot during COVID, we were traveling around the country and, um, you know, people were scared obviously because it felt very tenuous you know like uh, people were talking civil war like it was crazy stuff at that time and um but we were out there and hunting which had we do a chapter in the book on hunting um and uh hunting which had been slowly sort of disappearing in america like I, only four percent of americans hunt or whatever though it still lives large in our you know in the american sort of um mind but during covid hunting doubled because people were, there was, you know, food insecurity. People were nervous about, you know, there were runs on the supermarkets. And, um, and so people were able to sort of like step up and kind of handle it for themselves. And it made me, it made me think differently about hunting where I had always sort of had this city, city fied view of like, Oh my gosh, that's, that's bad. Right. But, I eat animals. Right. And you didn't kill them. So if you're going to, if you, if you want to get, you know, yes. And, and that. How and am I pointing fingers? Right. At people. Right. Exactly. Yeah. That's and one well, of the reasons why we can overconsume meat because we're not in there watching. We don't even go to the, it used to be you go to the butcher store and you actually see the animal whole and then the butcher chops it up for you. Right now it's so removed from that. Right. But, um, that's one of the reasons I eat less meat now. We did a thumbnail in the book. We just did like a thumbnail guess of how many animals I've eaten in my lifetime. And I was more than 30,000 animals that I've killed. And, and I didn't even include like, you know, the all you can eat Vegas buffets and the, you know, big Italian subs with the different kinds of meats laid on. This is just two, two meat, meats a day, right? Doesn't include all of the meat products that's in whatever hair product and so that's a crazy number, 30,000 animals that I, I, me alone have right. eaten is a crazy number. And, and that's changed, you know, with going out and, and killing, harvesting my own meat now. Um, and I've done it. Of, you have a different level of respect. You have a oh, different yeah. level of, and, and that's, 
I mean, it makes me think of, um, well, besides all those survivor shows, right. That like, if you, if you don't hunt, you're dead or you're coming off that right. show. Um, but also like in avatar, like, do you remember in avatar at the beginning of the movie, when she kills the, the animal, she like thanks it and blesses it. And, and for the, you know, and finding ways to use the whole animal, you know, I'm not like a, a skin wearer, nor I, would I ever be, but at the same time, like Doug said something about his mom's fur coat and I was, you know, judgy. Of course. But then I thought, but he's like, yeah, but that animal has lived on decades past it ever would. And I'm like, okay, all right. But she's not wearing it because she needs to stay warm. She's wearing yeah. it because, uh, because it's fanciful. I mean, she's 90. So, I mean, you know, she lived during the time where that was like the, a big thing. I don't think it's a big thing anymore. And if it is, I don't know about, it. don't tell me, I don't want to know. Um, <laughs> it's fine. I'm happy in my world. Uh, but th- going back to the show and what I think one of the benefits, you know, people do take that for granted. And people take for granted that they don't cook their food. They don't grow their food. They don't kill their food. They don't clean their food. They just eat their food. And then we wonder why one of the major reasons why we have health problems is that's one of them. But uh, there's, yeah, because we're trying to, and I, I see it coming. I see, you know, I talk about it. Other podcasts talk about it. People are, people are craving that simplicity that we've lost in the, in the industrialization and in the technology, you know, things move so fast we are not machines and we'll never keep up with the amount of information no. that's being put into the world at this time. Also with the amount that they want us to consume to keep up this constant growth that's going on. Like I remember, I remember they talk about second breakfasts and, and second Who? dinners where Taco Bell, like all these, oh. when they, when they're, <laughs> this stuff that they're pushing at you, you're sitting here, you're like, Oh my gosh, how am I going to consume enough for you, for your corporate profits? What do I have to shove into my face, right? Like, and they want us to just buy, 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 buy. And I think this generation is the young kids are, you know, everyone's wondering like, why aren't they buying houses and why aren't they? Because they realize they want to live an authentic life. They, right. they do not want to be slaves to all this stuff. And they're smart. And I think if we all are able to sort of start thinking that way um, and check out of, you see it in other countries around the world. We have, a in America, it's going to be hard for us. Like we've been on this sort of going 90 miles an hour for quite a while now. And, and you know, to pull over on the side of the road and catch our breath is going to be tough. Well, it only takes a few, I will say, you know, frequency wise, it only takes a few people who can really there's like you know the bell curve there's always going to be the masses who the kind of like the younger souls the ones who are kind of unconscious they're not you know they're not changing but but the ones driving the ships the leaders if you will like the leaders even in small communities are just energy like if you're doing change people will follow you i agree Um, and i look you're you're hopeful which i love and also the younger generations are doing it so that's important right because they're the ones who are going to be the future thought leaders or the thought leaders now i mean um they are extremely active and uh and it's great to watch um and the boat is churning it's just a big boat (laughs) it's just a huge ocean liner and and we have to churn it in time it's gotta like you know yeah that's time that's the time and consequence you know i think that the reason why i and a lot of i have a lot of 20 year olds that listen to my show uh because they find me refreshingly wanting to cut through the bullshit um, and just sort of, and because at the end of the day, who cares if you have a house, like what, you know, in, um, in my law of attraction quoting and speak, you know, there's a, there's a quote, my favorite quote that I say literally every day to somebody. Uh, and I'll say it to you and everyone who's listening. The only reason why you want what you want is because you think you'll feel better when you have it. Mm-hmm. And if you dial that back in every area of your life, the only reason why someone wants to own a house is because somehow that'll make you feel secure, which will make you feel happier. If you want the only reason why you want a relationship or blah, 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 it all boils down to somebody wants to feel better. And I think that the younger generation saw, you know, two working parents making money, buying things, having things and being miserable. And they're like, well, that don't work. I'm not doing that. And it really has nothing yeah. to do with, I don't think it's as big as they just wanted to save the planet. I think they're like, I'm going to call bullshit on you people who think that working a corporate job and saving up money for retirement for a job that you hated and finally being happy, like that model is done. I want nothing to do with it. I'm going to live in a tiny house. I'm going to backpack around. I'm going to be, you know, a nomadic in my work and not have to be stuck in one place. And I'm going to make, I'm going to wait. I'm not going to rush. I'm not going to participate in this kind of stuff. So I think 
for me anyway, the, the ones that I've come in contact with in my show and my audience, I think that's where their, their point of view is. It's just looking at, well, what you guys did didn't really work. <laughs> like, so I'm going to do it differently now. And yeah. even though they may not know what that means, they're just trusting their intuition. Well, also, they saw the mistakes. Back. They saw the mistakes that were made and they're going to, they're going to learn from that. Right. 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 Absolutely. And w- I know that one of the things that you're able to do in the book that you didn't do on the show as much because of time was to dial in and dial down into each of the different ingredients and the different countries and the different food productions, whether it be fish or meat or certain vegetables. And yeah. you, know, you were able to go through and talk about what we're just sort of discussing in more detail, more specifically in the book. So if you want to make a bigger contribution in your life to the food that you eat, to the people who are helping to create that food, because uh, it also will impact your health, it will impact your longevity, and obviously you're going to feel more connected to your life, um, get the book. It's out today. I uh, Go to discoverfromscratch.com. The link is below in the show notes here on the on YouTube and in, in the show more on the podcast. Um, but if you had to like dial down two or three of your either best experiences or biggest lessons, things you did not see coming that maybe were more personal and not as much global. What would you say? Mm -hmm. Wow. Well, it's shocking how little I knew about the ingredients that we eat that are commonplace. I mean, this didn't even make it in the book, but I went to there's an amazing orchard. Cornell University has an orchard, an apple orchard in upstate New York that has the 2000 most important apple varieties across humankind. So they actually, they actually have like the earliest apple trees, which come from like from Kazakhstan and the apples like are little golf ball sized green. They taste terrible. And you wouldn't even think that these are apples, right? But they've evolved over time into, and so apples are monogenetic. You cannot use the seeds from an apple to grow that apple tree. So if you have a red delicious apple, those seeds will not reproduce a red delicious. Red delicious, the tree only occurred once naturally in the world. And I think, I mean, I, I may be mixing up with another variety, but some some guy was walking down by a river, saw that the kids in his neighborhood, in his town, loved to play under that apple tree a lot, went over and tasted an apple, was like, this is delicious, and bought the land, put a cage around that tree, and started selling the branches. And that's how Red Delicious propagated. They take the branches, they graft them onto a root system, and all of the red delicious trees are descendant from that one tree. And that's how golden delicious happened. That's how every single, I mean, some, you know, uh, uh, Cornell is a ag school. So they, they are always testing and creating new apple breeds, but I didn't know, I didn't know how this is apple and apples are as Americans. It's apple pie. Right. So like I sat there and I was like, my mind was blown that, that's how apples, apple trees are grown. And then, you know, you walk down and you're trying like, well, first off, the history of apple is unbelievable. Uh, you know, there wasn't a lot of sugar in early America. Um, a- apples really were the sugar that you got, honey and apples. And so um, apple trees were almost like, um, uh, uh, if you had 50 trees, that was like having a bank. Right. Like you could go and get money against your trees. And in fact, when people were traveling west, the government, in order to give them a homesteading right, would be like, how many apple trees do you have with you? And <laughs> that's how much land. How much, they could how much are you worth based on your apple? Yeah. 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 And um, and so you taste, you know, the, the most important varieties over time, you know, and before beer, you know, ale, uh, uh, apple cider was really like the, the alcohol. Anyway, so. You get in these deep dives, go into potatoes, right? Like go to the Andes where, so we have this chapter in there about Peru and the four corner potato, um, which are genetically completely the Peruvian potatoes, you know, of the 4,000 potatoes, varieties of potatoes, pretty much all of them originate from Peru. There are 2,500, you know, uh, uh, varieties and then 
and then uh, we've cultivated another thousand or so. Um, but you go back and you look at sort of, first of all, potatoes in America, potatoes are a very nutritious fruit. Um, America has turned it into a terrible thing to eat. <laughs> Basically, we, we like potatoes anyway, as long as they're fried, right? Like that's how we'll do it. And, and chips uh, 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 and French fries is really how people eat potatoes. But when you go there, um, because different varieties will grow, but the Andes are like, you know, altitudes of 13,000 feet down into the Amazon on the other side. So you will have potatoes that grow at this altitude, but can't grow anywhere else in the world. So women will come into town to their markets with a sack on their back that that is the only, this is the only type of that potato in the world from their little village. And they all have different levels of nutritional value. Um, Peru recently, I mean, the Incas cultivated all different kinds of potatoes. And, but recently it started to sort of go towards how America did, like the um, sort of just the one type, uniform, large, fluffy white. But more recently, they've started to grow the potatoes back into these old multicolored, really misshapen. I mean, the names that the Incas used to have were like, you know, um, woman with the neck of a vulture, right? That was what the potatoes supposedly looked like, right? <laughs> or, or the puma paw, which like, it looks like that. Um, and they all have different flavors, all have incredible nutritional value. Um, and for, I will say Peru overall was an incredible place. Um, it may be the best food country in the world right now. Um, I think they have like the number two restaurant in the world from the you know 50 best and the number five. And so we did a meal at, at Central, which is the number two restaurant in the world. And what you realize is that, you know, chocolate most likely originated in Peru, potatoes most likely originated in Peru, tomatoes and corn, you know, their uh, corn is, they battle back and forth with Mexico about where corn came from. And then someone, it always happens, like they discover, oh, we have an earlier corn. And then Mexico's, they discover an earlier corn. Anyway, so you feel like, oh my gosh, the foundational ingredients that come from Peru. Um, and the amazing uh, sort of um, laboratory, uh, agricultural laboratories that the Incas created five, 600 years ago um, are phenomenal. They built these tiers uh, on the mountains um, and would get ingredients. Um, first of all, they would put these stones there. So the sun would hit the stones all day and keep uh, uh, that mound warm throughout the night. And they, they built them in such a way that there was a difference in temperature of about 20 centigrade from the bottom to the top. So they would take an Amazonian potato or something and bury it or, 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 or grow it on the bottom for one season and then move it to the next and move it to the next. So by the time you could grow this Amazonian potato at the top of the Andes, because they, um, were are basically doing laboratory testing. Um, just, just phenomenal stuff. I, I highly recommend going and doing a food tour through Peru. Um, you'll gain 20 pounds like me and, uh, and, and some of the most delicious food in the world is coming out of there right now. Virgilio, um, who's the chef at Central is this mad genius who takes the chocolate um, fruit and we just use the seed, right? That's, that's how we make our chocolate, but he makes desserts out of every part of this cacao fruit. Um, and then and I probably shouldn't tell everybody about this, but there's a cousin of the cacao that we don't know about here, but that they know about there and they make chocolates. It's not chocolate cause it's not a cacao, but this fruit the seeds taste like Nutella. And so they're doing things with this seed. Um, uh, just like, oh my God. <laughs> well, before anybody goes anywhere, you want to yeah. watch the show and read the book. <laughs> so, yeah. uh, so get the book so that you can well, use my book as like a travel guide. I talk about all these wonderful places to go and places where you can harvest food um, down there. 
Yeah. The show's the show is entertaining also. And again, follow David on Instagram. So that way, as soon as he knows where they're going to land, uh, you'll know where to go. So <laughs> well, that was kind of funny because uh, I just installed a whole bunch of apps on my, I don't have cable. So I'm like, I kept getting these texts from you. I can't find it. <laughs> where is this the show? Is I want to watch a show. <laughs> I'm like, I get that we're, you know, I've read a quarter of the book. Um, probably more than a quarter of the book, but I want to, I want to see the show too. I want to yeah. see, I want to see you out there and you know, I know you and I miss you. Um, it's been a long time and I'm really excited about what this project is that you're working on and sort of what, you know, it's entertaining, it's educational, it's a mission. It's a, you know, it's a, it's a mission. It's something that's helping the world at the same time. You're, you're learning so much and you're passionate about it. And it's exciting. It is exciting to learn. And, uh, and anything else you, you know, to be, I mean, obviously watch the show and read the book, buy the book. And yeah. Are there are two seasons of the show. Yeah, we have uh, 20 episodes. We're about to start season three, um, which will be another 15. And then we have a spinoff, which is kind of cool. You and I talked briefly about it because I was looking up in Ojai to purchase uh, a house for the for the season. And we are going to uh, renovate um, a house from scratch. And basically what that means is that um, if I'm going to do the floor in bamboo flooring, I'm going to go harvest bamboo, uh, make the epoxies and, you know, lay down the flooring. If I'm going to make a, 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 a faucet, I will mine iron, smelt steel, go to mowing, learn how to make a mold and make a faucet. So I'm going to have my hands in. I don't think I can have my hands in everything because we want the house to be able to stand and not fall. On <laughs> but I will have my hands in all the materials. So yeah. like I will learn how you make copper wiring from, from the ground to the light bulb. Right. So I think it's going to be, I mean, for me, uh, I'm hyper excited about this because it's a new path. Um, and also I think touching on the same stuff about sustainability and the, yep. you know, construction is the second worst polluter in the world um, behind sort of cars and planes and stuff, transportation. Um, so it, it's interesting all the neat things that are happening um, as people realize, oh, we can do things better. We can make, do things smarter um, in building houses. And, and uh, yeah. Yeah. So look out for that too. That's also going to be when this deal is finalized. Uh, it'd be so nice if when this comes on, I'll be like at the bottom and say, see us here. Um, yeah. yeah. And if not, Again, follow David on Instagram and I can share it too on my channels. So whenever, you know, I mean, cause I want to watch it. We had a good time yeah. watching it and I want to watch all of them and especially the one in Italy. So, um, <laughs> the, for the, even though I know, especially cause when you, with the guys and you be like, I'm going to go make my own cheese. You're not going to help me. Like I, anyway, I would like, if that was like, caught on camera, I want to see that little exchange. Yeah. They so, trimmed it. They trimmed it a bit. It they? is caught on camera. You see the not that none of us are happy with each other, but the actual, the, as feisty as it gets, it's better in the book. Okay. Because right, A and E was like, "Are you? Are you? You really want to show like almost getting into a fist fight with these cheesemakers?" <laughs> and I was like, "I guess we can't." <laughs> well, I mean, it is reality TV. Why not? I mean, it yeah. it, it, it it provides some drama, <laughs> so right, it takes care of that for you. So, yeah. all right, everybody, get the book. Be on lookout for the show. If you love food or want to have a better relationship with food, you want to heal your shit with food. Again, this is a place to start because you can deepen that respect and also just acknowledge where you aren't living maybe as authentically as you would like to. And I definitely think of one of the benefits of crazy couple of years um, was to learn how to freaking take care of yourself, which is where we're going to end up anyway, if you if things don't change. Right. And, uh, and that's, and that's not a bad thing. And sometimes that, you know, this path gets us back to kind of simplicity. And I think that's really what people want. They want to feel, you know, everyone wants ha happiness. Well, you got to get back to simplicity and being, not just doing. And part of that is being present and um, learn how to live. I mean, if, if we all lost electricity, we'd be in a whole nother situation, right? Because you'd have to haunt your food and you'd have to learn a whole new set of skills that our ancestors have known for, you know, that's we're built on that. So it's time yeah. for a reality check. And uh, and start to learn some new things that are very functional to your life. So, David, it was so fun. We could talk for hours. Um, yeah. I, I really want everyone to watch the show. I'm looking forward to it, finding a home and being able to watch all. Well, the thank episodes. you so much for having me on. This is amazing. And we got to catch up at the same time, which was beautiful. We and uh, I got to go up to Ojai and, and see you in person next. Of course. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You're always welcome. All right, everybody. Buy the book. Mm -hmm.